that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 511th edition of Energy Week with George Harvey and Tom Fennell. Tom, again, is not in the studio, and unfortunately, we've had some problems with sound here. So um, if, if Tom's sound is not 100%, um, it's not his fault. It's just that a, there's, there happens to be a gremlin that got into the studio. That's his roar on your that's for sure. <laughs> Well, anyway, um, so we're doing an eight-day show starting on the um, 15th of February and ending on the 22nd of February. Today is the 23rd, the day that we're recording. And uh, I guess we can, uh, oh, if you need to, to get to these uh, articles, you can go to my blog, geoharvey.com, click on the day. We'll try to keep the days updated as, as we go, so you'll know what day. You can also go to the, um, f the file or the website, uh, Ener Energy Week 511, and you should be able to find that by scrolling down on your screen. So we're ready to go, Tom. Well, we might as well start. Okay, our first, our first article is from Public News Service, and we've got a picture here of daffodils. And in the background, there's a solar charging thing going on with solar panels up above and a vehicle down below. What do you have? Interesting. It says it's a solar van charging at NYIT. Now, I thought NYIT was in New York City. Well, it might, it, might, to me. it might be that this is in their backyard, you know. Yes, it's there there entirely possible. There are places in Prospect Park, for example, where you can you can sit down and have a picnic and there's not a single building in sight no matter what direction you look. You can do a lot of that in Central Park, really. Yes, you can. A lot of Central Park is, 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 you know, it's a short distance from a whole lot of people, but it's, it's a different world. Yeah, well, there are coyotes living in Central Park, or at least there were the last time I checked. Okay, what do, you have, so. what do you have for a title for the article, Tom? <laughs> 2024, I got it now. Okay. 2024 budget calls on NYPA to help develop renewables. And you're going to find out what NYPA is in a very short period. Yeah, of time. absolutely. New York's 2024 executive budget seeks to advance renewable energy through the New York Power Authority. That's NYPA. The agency could use funds from the 2022 Inflation Reduction Act to help the state meet its energy efficiency goals. Some observers feel it's a step in the wrong direction, but of course, that is a matter of politics, and I'm f sorry for the sign that came up in the middle of the screen. Tom didn't see it, but it's somebody saying that he wants something from somebody. No. <laughs> and, you know, it's one of these computer things. It comes up every show, it seems. I mentioned it to Nolan. He said he'd, he'd try to figure out what it was. Okay. Well, I don't see it, so it's nah. But I, 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 some of the uh, some of the people watching this, I think everybody who is watching who is watching the screen, would have seen the sign come up. I just made it go away. Okay, we're going to go on unless you have more to say about that. Ah, it's time to move on. Okay, we have a picture of a Greenway charging system charging a VW ID four. If you can figure out what I'm saying when I say that. And uh, this is a uh, this this is an article from Clean Technica. I'll give you a uh, I'll let you I'll let you try to pronounce who is it courtesy of. Uh, no, thank you. <laughs> it's a name in Polish. You know, I I don't speak Polish. I don't even have any idea. There's letters in Polish. I have no idea how to how to how to pronounce them. Well, let me read what it says here. EU fit for fifty five zero. CO2 emissions for new cars and, and vans in 2035. Nice. 
The European Parliament approved legislation setting the path toward zero CO2 emissions for new passenger cars and light commercial vehicles in 2035. New intermediate emission reduction targets for 2030 are set for 20, uh, for 55% for passenger cars and 50% for vans. Now, why the difference? I don't know. I, you know, it's it's just politics. I think you know somebody somebody pushed a button and everybody else responded. <laughs> there like there are, are a number of countries in Europe that have met this target all these targets already. I mean, Norway's almost to 100 percent for for vehicles. Well, it's a step in the right direction. That's for sure. It is. Okay, should we go on? Yeah, that came from Clean Technical. Let me turn over this phone so that my chin doesn't keep making. Sense. <laughs> okay. Our next item is from Clean Technica also, and this is uh, a picture of a road in Colorado. Let me put that up so people can see it. I used to live in Colorado. I remember it looking a bit like this, but that was 70... I imagine the vistas in Colorado, for, for the most part, are rather attractive. A lot of them are, but there's a lot of prairie in Colorado, and some people find that kind of dull. You know, the things that I'm writing that are fiction now are set on the prairie, and, and a lot of the people are just talking about how much they love the prairie. But I remember Colorado looking like this. Um, we lived in Boston. We moved out of Boston, I think, in 1950. Wow, I'm going to say 1951. I might be wrong. It was a little different in those days in Boston, in, uh, in Denver, rather. I'm sorry, I said Boston. It was uh, a little bit different in those days. Okay, what do you have for title? Ten and a half percent of new vehicle sales now electric in Colorado. Yeah, last year, ten and a half percent of new vehicles sold in Colorado were EVs. That's a great result for the United States, which on the whole is closer to six or seven percent of new vehicle sales being electric. Colorado got to this place with an extra helping of incentives for people who go electric. You know, it's, it's the way of the future. It Everything's sure is. moving in that direction. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've said on the show before, people are going to look back at, at these days and say, remember, remember people used to pay for fuel? Why would you buy gasoline or diesel oil? The stuff is disgusting. And it costs a lot of money. Okay. Our well, we're, we're, we're up to Thursday, February 16th, and we have a picture of, whoa, What's that a picture of, Tom? Looks like a Tesla Roadster in space. <laughs> That's what it is. that guy breathes. I don't think he does. I, I spent a little time trying to figure out what continent that is behind him, and I haven't got it. I, I can't even figure out what direction north is in this. It might be... It might be... It could be a different direction, right? It could be. I mean, this north could be down. But yeah. I, that could be the south coast of Australia. It could be uh, the south coast of, of Western Africa. I don't know. I, I looked at it. And p part of the problem is that as you get f closer and closer to the horizon on these things, everything flattens out. Okay, Clean Technica, what do you got for a title? Celebrating 10 years of Tesla production and the EV. Okay, Tesla has officially been on the road for 15 years since the first Roadster rolled off the prote uh, production line on February 1st, 2008, and what a decade and a half it has been. Tesla used to be a niche startup automaker. Now it is an innovating, innovating force behind the automobile industry's shift to electrification. Needs to know what an EV is, but for those that don't, it's an electrical vehicle. Yeah, and by the way, that term is used uh, to cover both full battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids. Correct. So you know, it's it's there's a, there's a lot going on there. Okay, more on this. <coughs> well, let's move on. We got let's some move on. In the Twigs Gate Glacier in 2020, and that's scary. Yeah, well, you know, this is from CNN, and it is scary, I'm sorry to say. What do you got? So-called Doomsday Glacier is in trouble. 
after finding surprising formations under the ice shelf. Yeah. The Doomsday Glacier, a nickname because its collapse could drive catastrophic sea level rise, is melting rapidly and in unexpected ways, new research shows. Antarctica's Thwaites Glacier is roughly the size of Florida. And that's, if, a, that's a big piece of ice, that's it's for a, sure. Yeah, it's a big piece of ice. Before people panic about this, I want to point out that in some respects, according to this article, it's actually melting more slowly than they thought it was. But there's another thing, too, and that is it is in trouble. And if it breaks free or if it, if it collapses, that doesn't mean that there's going to be a big splash and that New York City and Boston and, and Miami will suddenly be at the bottom of the sea. It means that the sea level rise will happen much, much more rapidly and will go farther than if we could prevent it from collapsing. But unfortunately, preventing it from collapsing, the time, best time to prevent it from collapsing has already gone by. Well, so, sea level rise is not a problem in Brattleboro, but it's really a big problem in Florida. It's a big problem in Florida, and if it gets into a worst-case scenario, Brattleboro is going to be pretty close to the sea. Believe it or not, this the closer than it is. Yeah, the ocean could actually come up to as near as Northfield, Massachusetts. I can't hear what you just said. The ocean could come up as near as Northfield, uh, Massachusetts. Could it really? Wow. Well, they're talking about a 200 foot rise, and the Connecticut River is at an altitude of a little less than 200 feet in Northfield. There you go. Yeah. And that would mean that Brattleboro would be pretty close to the end of a very long fjord that would go down through Massachusetts and Connecticut. Um, so there you have it. That's from CNN. Not something not to look forward to. No, it's not. It's not. Um, but, you know, this is something that, as I said, would happen much more slowly than... Uh, you know, it's not something that would happen overnight. It's not something that would happen over the course of a year or a decade. It's something that would take multiple decades, but we don't know how many. Okay, we're up to the next piece, which is um, from Clean Technica. Let me put the put the uh, photo. Nice picture of an electric truck. Yeah, if you like electric trucks, that looks like a dump truck. I mean, a garbage truck. I was going to say a garbage truck. Yeah. I grew up in New York City, and garbage trucks make a lot of noise. They make a lot of noise. I mean, it's the garbage handling mechanism in the truck that makes all that noise. Yeah. They're horrible. Yeah. And, and you know, they could rig these things to make as much noise as they want, but <laughs> they well, will... It's going to be fully electric. They're cutting, cutting back on the noise an awful lot. They would be cutting back on the noise a lot. As I said, this is from Clean Technica. What do you have for uh, uh, for a, a, a title f for the article? New York City may soon set the pace for municipal vehicle electrification. Yeah, the New York City Council is considering a bill that would codify a path toward a 100% zero emission municipal fleet. This proposal would require the city's entire on-road fleet, including heavy-duty trucks and specialty vehicles, to transition to zero emission vehicles by mid uh, 2035. That means, you know, snow that removal equipment. Quick, really? What? That re that's coming up pretty quick than you want to think. It is. And that means snow plows and things like that. This is not a, a trivial move. This is a big deal. Okay? Absolutely. So we, should we go to the next issue? It's Friday, February 17th, coming up. Is it really? Oh, thank you for ma making that note. Okay, we have a picture here looking down the aisle of a factory, and what they're, ma what they're doing there is pro they are producing 3D printed solid state batteries. This is in Clean Technica. I can't even conceive of a 3D printed circuit battery. <laughs> Well, As I said on this show, in the entire four years of electrical engineering, we spent 47 minutes talking about batteries. Oh, I thought it was 47 seconds, but in the, never, <laughs> nevertheless, well, 
Yeah. They were just a non-entity. You had batteries in your flashlight. You had batteries in your car. Yep. And a telephone company had big, great, big, great, big batteries and nothing else you needed to know. Well, they had big batteries in submarines, too, so they could run underwater. I don't think we even touched base with that one. Really? They were, they were just big lead-acid batteries, like a car batteries. Basically, yes. Yeah, I remember seeing one when I was uh, when I was live as a child. Uh, went to the uh, I'm going to say the Museum of Science and Industry. They had no, the Museum of Science and Industry had the U505, uh, which was a German submarine that was captured. Uh, but there was a do there was a place in Chicago where there was a a submarine called the U the, the it was called the Silver, Silver Sides, and um, you could tour it. And you know, I I went down, looked at the battery. It was really interesting. It was huge, and somebody said, "Don't touch that." <laughs> so, what do you have for a title for this one? Sacru, <laughs> that's the way you pronounce it. Yeah. Pronounces. A 3D printed solid state battery success. Yeah, the name of this place reminds me of a, an episode of F Troop that was on television. That was a sitcom about the, the 19th century cavalry in the United States, and F Troop was the center of it. And in one thing that they, the episode, they were talking about the burglar, the burglar of Bumpf. <laughs> what? Burglar of Bumpf. Because Banff is spelled with two Fs. So they, they were making fun of it. Okay, Sahu uh, announced it has successfully and, and consistently fabricated 3D printed full functional batteries in custom shapes and sizes at its Silicon Valley battery pilot pro facility since December. Yeah, since the December of last year. The battery cells contain patterned openings for thermal management. So this is something that, this is, this is kind of interesting because it means that you can make batteries just about any shape you want them. Pretty much. Yeah. So, you, do you have more on that? No, I think we ought to move on. Okay. That did come from Queen Technical, if you didn't mention that. Yeah, our next one is from Power Engineering. They didn't have a good picture, so I found one of wind turbines on the high plains. Let me put it up. What do you have for a title? Wind turbines on a prairie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, no. The... Texans support expanding renewable energy over fossil fuels. Mm. Now, this is interesting because it's Texas. Yeah, that's right. Two years after winter storm Uri left millions in Texas without power for days, a poll found that the majority of Texans support expanding U.S. reliance on solar power, 64% of them said that they, they did that. 59% supported geothermal, 57% supported wind, and only 41% favored expanding U.S. reliance on onshore conventional oil and gas. So I find that really interesting. You know, Texas is, Texas is a place that has been associated with oil and gas since long before I was born. Oh, sure, yeah. And, and you know... Florida, Texas, you're of oil. And, and after, after this storm Uri happened, the, the uh, various people in the government in Texas were sitting there saying, well, it's all the fault of the wind turbines and the solar power and so forth. And it all. yeah, it, it turned out that they were, I don't know if they were simply wrong or if they were intentionally lying, but they, you know, this turned out not to be true. So, I think the truth is somewhere between those two. I don't think they were intentionally lying, but they were lying because they thought that was the truth. I think they thought it was tr the truth, but I think they were jumping to conclusions, among other things. Well, that's where they wanted it to be. They didn't, yeah. <laughs> they didn't want to think that these renewables were more weather resistant. Okay, we have a, a piece coming up. We're at Saturday, February 18th, by the way. We have another piece from Clean Technica. This is an interesting piece of ocean. And by the way... There's of North Sea seaweed farming. Yeah, which doesn't exist yet. And you can tell that this is 
a, 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 an artist's rendering, not a photograph. You want to know how? Yeah, it's hard to make those lines in the ocean. Well, not only that, but in the lower left corner, there's two seagulls flying. Oh, yeah. And if those seagulls were in that position, they would be have to be way higher than any of those wind turbines. And seagulls don't fly that high. And they're not as big as boats. No, they're not as big as boats. <laughs> You're right about that. But this is from Clean Technica, and you have a title for the article, I'll bet you. Amazon boosts its sustainability credentials with record renewable energy purchases, plus offshore wind seaweed fire farming. Oh, okay, when I read this, I thought, what? 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 Let me read the synopsis. Amazon announced adding 8.3 gigawatts of renewable energy to its portfolio in 2020 uh, with 133 projects in, in 11 uh, countries. What's 8.3 gigawatts, Tom? Gigawatts, baby. Yeah. It now has access to more than 20 gigawatts of green power. What's next for Amazon? Seaweed farming. Okay, do you want to talk about this, Tom, or should I? Well, seaweed farming, we're, we're not too likely to be eating seaweed in, in the near future, but cattle gobble it up. You know what, Tom? I eat seaweed f from time to time. Do you? Yeah, absolutely I do. You can buy it down at the co-op in various forms. And truth be told, if somebody is eating sushi, he's probably eating seaweed. Because they, they wrap the sushi with seaweed. And there's a thing called laver bread. And Richard Burton said that laver bread was the Welsh equivalent of caviar. And laver, okay. laver bread is actually seaweed. Um, is it really? Yeah, yeah absolutely. A lot yeah, of people Burton eat... Should know. What's that? Richard Burton should know. I would think that Richard Burton would know, yeah. Absolutely. He's not around, unfortunately, but if he were, he would probably still know. Okay, and what they're doing is, in that picture, let me put the picture back up. In that picture, there are areas, you can see that there's a couple of boats that are sitting on things that look like they're rectangles in the water, and those rectangles are seaweed farms. Okay, I'll buy, I'll buy that. And they, the thing that the people at Google figured out was ships are not allowed to go through these, um, these uh, offshore wind farms and uh, because, you know, they don't want to have accidents uh, destroying the, the... It would be a disaster for a ship to run into a, 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 a turbine there. Absolutely, but also a ship, you know, th ships occasionally drop their anchors by accident or on yeah. purpose or whatever, and they could pick up a submarine cable, and that would be make a mess. That has happened. Yeah, and so th the people at Google figured out, well, wait a minute, there's, some, there's an opportunity here. We could use that ocean for farming and farming seaweed. And seaweed, it's pretty good for you, unless you're allergic to, uh, unless you've got a salt problem. Well, it makes a lot of sense. It sure does. Okay, our next item here is um, from, also from, we're getting a lot from Clean Technica today. This well, is they a, got good stuff. Yeah, this is um, from uh, Clean Technica, and there is a picture of Ford CEO Bill Ford. Do you suppose he's related to them? I was thinking that was very coincidental. <laughs> I used to know somebody who's in the Ford. I've known a couple of people in the Ford family who didn't have any money, by the way. They weren't Richard. part of that of that part of the family. But the Ford family is really interesting. I, I knew an Episcopal priest whose name was Father Ford. And he gave me some books, by the way, that were really good. Um, <clears throat> anyway... This is from Clean Technica. You have a have a title. What's your What's the title of the story? For Ford first to build NMC batteries and LFP batteries in the USA. Okay. What are those things? What are those things? We will find out in a moment. Ford has become the number two EV seller in the United States, but it's also now the first automaker to state that it will produce both nickel manganese cobalt. 
That's, uh -huh. that's NMC and lithium iron phosphate, which is, um, which is L, LFP. Is yeah. Yeah, that's right. L lithium iron phosphate batteries for electric vehicles in the United States. It is investing a full three and a half billion dollars into a new lithium uh, iron phosphate battery factory in Michigan. So there you have that. Three and a half billion is not, is not hay. Well, you know, three and a half billion. Let's see, if we took three and a half billion and we gave it to all the people in Vermont, that would mean three and a half billion going to 650,000 roughly people. So that's a lot of money per person. I would take. <laughs> we could all hire New Yorkers and people from New, from, uh, New Hampshire to do all our work for a while while we rest on our laurels. Yeah, okay, our next item is also from Clean Technica. And um, it, he, we it's have- coming up ready for Sunday, February the 19th. Oh, thank you. Yes, you're right. Um, this is a, a picture of concentrating solar plant. And this plant that you see here happens not to be in operation, which you can tell because when they're in operation, the tower, which is about it's three- quite big in the middle. Yeah, sort of the the white thing, kind of to the right of the middle and a little bit above the middle. It's that's a tower, and the top of that tower would be glowing if this. Well, what's going on here is instead of having these semiconductor-based uh, solar panels on the ground, yeah, they got mirrors. Yeah, that's right. Mirrors are reflecting the sun yep. up into that top of that tower, right where. It collects the heat, turns it into steam, and runs a turbine. That's right. Okay. What do you have for a title? I bet you I could find that out. I'll bet you can. <laughs> DOE just can't quit concentrating solar power. And that's a good thing. Yes. Fans of concentrating solar power have a dream of a 100 megawatt facility that can deliver electricity 24-7, just like a nuclear power plant, but without the risk and the fancy price tag. Now, I could get into that risk thing in case anybody thinks there's no risk, because some people do, but I'm not going to do it right now except for one thing, and that is that I can say it is vastly understated by, by the, solar, the uh, nuclear industry. Now, the U.S. DOE has a new ceramic-based technology that will, could deliver the goods. So if you want... the difference between solar concentrated power and semiconductor-based solar power is that the uh, concentrated power takes up a lot less real estate? I think, yeah, I think that's right, Tom. It does. It, it, it's, a, it's a pretty respectable-sized thing, though. Um, there is one thing about the concentrating solar power that bothers people, and that is every once in a while, some poor bird flies in near the tower and finds itself catching fire. Um, there are people who oppose this. You ain't going to do that again. No. There are people who oppose this, and they historically have vastly overstated the the uh, number of birds dying as a result of that, but well, it's something that's a fact that we don't know about is take for example Manhattan, how many birds die because they oh. crashed into skyscrapers. You know the biggest killer of birds is feral cats. The second, feral cat, you're absolutely right. Second biggest ca killer of birds is domestic cats. You know, yeah. and then right. and then you go through the list and you find buildings are among among the biggest killers of birds, and wind towers and, and these solar plants are, are down fairly close to the bottom of the list. I spent a fair amount of time one day, a couple of hours, trying to figure out how they know how many birds get killed by what kinds of things. And I finally came across a peer-reviewed paper that detailed a, a, a bird mortality in uh, count that happened. And in this particular count, um, it was it, during migration season, f they estimated that 5,000 birds had been killed at a single site where they were generating power in a, 
in a 48 hour period. So that means, uh, means that, that the, these birds were dying very fast. But well, nobody the, knows how many birds are dying in Manhattan, for example. Oh, well, in, the, in, this particular, in this particular site, Tom, there were no wind turbines. There was no solar facility. This was birds crashing into cooling towers for coal burning and nuclear power uh, uh, operation. How come you never hear about that? Well, <laughs> there is a good question. How come you don't? Okay. Um, did I read? Did we read? The, yes, I, I did read that. Okay. Do you have more here, or should we go on? No, I just said it, that it uses up less real estate. But oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, we have. I a, do know this that in New York City, the uh, super tenants or whatever you call them, janitors of the various apartment uh, skyscrapers in New York, every morning have to have to clean up birds. Oh yes. Yeah. And we're not talking songbirds like robins and, and sparrows. We're talking, you know, big birds like geese, and we're talking yeah, seagulls. Yeah, that's true. Like that. I used to live in a house that had five picture windows in the living room. I mean, two walls were basically <laughs> just picture windows. And the walls were at, at you know, a, you, could, you could look through from the outside. You could look through the living room. To, to the yard on the other side. Birds would try to fly through there. And I had a cat who figured out that a nice way to get fed was just to sit at the bottom of one of the picture windows and wait for a bird. <laughs> you got to give cats credit for having an intelligence. So they, sure. they have a very sneaky kind of intelligence. Anyway, we've got a picture here of a, of a Tesla police car and uh, this is an, another item from Clean Technico. As I said, we've this got... This is an interesting application because police cars almost never shut off. Right. So but, all day long, more often than not, the car is, the car is, is idling. You know, Tom, it, you... It's using up fuel and giving off emissions. And it's, that, that idling is, is really hard on the engine, which is why police cars don't usually last more than about three years. Correct. And, you know, there it is. And um, as I said, this is another one from Clean Technica. What do you have for a title? For an electric car, the guy just shuts off the key. That's right. Or if he leaves the key on, the car doesn't go. The it doesn't go doesn't anywhere. City, city That's up. right. It, 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 you have the cars last longer. The result of that is the investment in an electric police car is a much better investment than one in a car that runs on gasoline. What do you have for a title for this article? Tesla Model Y expected to save police departments $83,810. I guess that's per police department, isn't it? That's per car. The per car. Per car. Yeah. Wow. The police the police departments have been investing in EVs, though some critics point to their higher purchase price and the question uh, and question the move. But the police forces stand to save a lot of money in fuel costs and maintenance. And not only that, but in in the speed the the lifetime of the car and the, and how often they have to be replaced. They need... Well, fuel costs for one thing. If it's, if it's idling all day long, it uses up a lot of, a lot of a gas. A lot of gas. They're, 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 this um, was recently pointed out um, by, a, by a particular police department in Wisconsin. Good for him. So there you go. Okay. Moving right along, okay. It's February the twentieth. We have February the twentieth, and I'm going to put up a coffee plantation in Sao Paulo. Yeah, this is a, this is an interesting picture. the The dark part of that picture uh, in the bottom thirty percent is a hedge that's very near the the photograph, and the coffee plantation is beyond that. And you can see it. that coffee plantation looks almost like a crop circle to me. Well, everything is in a nice orderly row. That's right. Here we've got uh, an article from the BBC. What do you have for a title? Dozens killed as deadly storms hit the Brazilian coast. This is weird. Um, by the way, this is not as weird as what's going on today in the United States. 
Did you no. did you hear about the 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 area around Los Angeles is under a winter storm warning? They're expecting a blizzard. Los Angeles, huh? Los Angeles. Wow. The temperatures in Montana are going almost to 10 below zero, and at the same time, temperatures in Florida are going well above 90. So wow. the, the United States is just crazy. Sure, I doubt. Yeah. Anyway, here's an article from the BBC, and you've already read the title, so I'll read the synopsis. In the Brazilian state of Sao Paulo, authorities say at least 36 people were killed in heavy flooding and landslides. This is not what you expect. Over 600 millimeters, that is 23.6 inches of rain, fell in some areas in, in one day. That's almost two feet of rain in one day. That is twice the amount that they would expect for a month. Extreme weather events are expected to become more common with climate change. So is this a problem? Yeah, again, because that's true. Extreme weather events are expected to be more common with climate change. They're going on in the United States right now. And in fact, here in Brattleboro, we're, we're going from snow that fell last night to warmer weather to bone chillingly cold weather and back to normal you know it's in over the course of the next few days it's bouncy yeah yesterday it's, my my lawn was green today it's white yeah that's right that's what's going on okay we should go on ourselves to the next item and uh let me let me get this a picture of a bus on a lift yeah i thought this was kind of an interesting picture um this actually came with the article. This was from... That's an electric bus. That is an electric bus. It's actually, if you look, you'll see that it says right on the side, 100% electric. And this is from Clean Technica. It's got no grill. It's got no grill. That's right. Although you can do that with a bus by having the engine in the back. Which is what they do. Yeah, it's what they do. But in this particular case, there's no engine in the back. What do you have for a title? CMA services to bring, to bring electric buses to more routes in Nairobi. Well, Nairobi's in Kenya, and Kenya is a pretty progressive African country. That is correct. And by the way, that's not CMA, it's OMA. But Oh, yes, I said CMA. I yeah, you it. did. It's okay. Um, Basico, a, a Kenyan electric mobility startup working to revolutionize the public transportation sector by providing public transport bus owners with cost-effective electric alternatives to diesel buses has, and that's a long startup to ascend, has delivered BYD K6 electric buses to another operator in Nairobi. And the point is, um, the United States may be slow in, in t uh, taking up electric buses, but here in Africa, you know, there in Africa, they, they've got enough sense to realize that electric buses are the, the thing of the future. And by the way, BYD has a program that these people in places like Kenya can, can get into where the bus companies don't buy the batteries, which are the most expensive part of the bus. They you lease the them. Battery. And they can they can have a smaller capital outlay and have smaller costs. So why in the world would you buy a bus that it has a diesel engine or a gasoline engine just because it comes from Detroit? Are you kidding me? You're going to spend well, extra for that? It's Chinese. It's called. It, it means build your dreams. That's right. That's what it is. And you know, there it is. Uh, the the um, United States under the <laughs> influence. Okay. Yeah, under the influence of oil and gas companies, they have allowed that that entire market to move to China, and it, I just I'm I'm angry about that. Anyway, we should go on, shouldn't we? We should. We should. We have an item here. Believe it or not, this comes from Clean Technica. Okay. How about that? Yeah. And it's a picture of. Are you ready? Yeah. Turbines. <laughs> Turbines, that's correct. Oh, man. 
wasted wind energy and terrible transmission during Winter Storm Elliot. Yeah, it's been nearly... That's what you just talked about, isn't it? No, we, we were talking about a different one. Um, Yuri, we were talking about. This is Elliot, different what? winter storm. It has been nearly two months since Winter Storm Elliot caused energy emergencies across the United States and rolling blackouts throughout the Southeast. Among the lessons that uh, are, uh, are that wind power and interregional transmission can reduce blackouts. Bingo. Bingo. So there you've got it. Now we're up to um, Tuesday, the 21st of February, and here is a picture of a city called Suzhou, which is in China. Interesting city. It's a pretty good sized city. That's a pretty good sized city. You know, there used to be a song. There's no, still a blue thing in the middle. No, that's a big blue skyscraper um, the, uh, with a weird design, I think. I think you're right. This is from CNN, and uh, I just wanted to comment. There's a song uh, called Everything's Up to Date in Kansas City. And, yeah. and the song says they even have a skyscraper seven stories tall. <laughs> and here you go to Suzhou, rather. How many people, raise your hands, have uh, knowledge of where Suzhou is? Well, there's a reason why this picture is of Suzhou. What do you have for a title for the article, Tom? Chinese provinces and Florida among the most climate vulnerable regions in the world. Yeah. China is home to 16 out of the 20 regions of the world that are most vulnerable to climate change, according to a new study. With some of the world's most important manufacturing hubs at risk in that area, Another of the uh, 20 places is Florida, the whole state. And the reason why Suzhou is up on the screen is because that is going to be underwater. Is it really? Well, if, if we have the, have the uh, sea level rise that they're expecting, that's going to go underwater. And quite yeah. frankly, Tom, I don't see how we can avoid that sea level rise. It's already baked into the to the uh, climate change pie. It's, it's just there. We can't get it out. We're not, we, we aren't- The world uh, is getting warmer. Yeah. And it's because of men's activities. It's basically because they burn things. Yeah, that's right. That is correct. Now what do we do? Well, we have another article coming up from Clean Technica. Should we look at that? Right now? Yeah. Or do Be you sure. have- do you have more to say about China or Florida? No, I don't. I, gotta, I, I can look at this uh, excavator here. <laughs> it's an electric excavator. That's, that's right. And this is also from Clean Technica. Man, we, there's just so much stuff this week from Clean Technica. What do you have? Volvo CE invests in earth, in, in battery pack production. Yeah. And Volvo CE is different from Volvo cars. That's right. Volvo and Volvo CE is uh, owned by a um, Chinese company, I believe. I think Vol you're right. Volvo CE has announced plans to invest millions into its excavator plant in Changwon, South Korea, to build battery packs like the one in the upcoming EC230 electric excavator. That's the, what that picture that's is. That's what that picture is. The factory is about 1.1 million square meters, which is an almost unimaginable 11.84 million square feet. That's big. Uh, that, that's, that's mind-blowing. It's, it's like if you were in that building and none of the interior walls were there and you could just see the other side, I don't think you'd see the other side. <laughs> I think you're right. Yeah. It's, it's larger than large. It's huge. It's huge. That's right. Should we go on? I think so. Okay. We have a picture now, I'll put it up, of a farm. Uh, it's courtesy of the Idaho National Laboratory. And uh, this got, article, believe it or not, is from... we got a different thing here. Oh, do we? Yeah. I do. 
I got Wednesday, February 22nd, and I got a picture of a house with solar panels. No, it's the one between that and the one that we just looked at. This is a farm. That's, the one between that I have is the Volvo excavator. Well, then some, somehow you didn't get this image. Looks like I did, yeah. It's a, it's a picture of, a, of an... What it is. Huh? Tell us what it is. It's supplying. It's a picture of a of an of an irrigation system supplying f uh, water to a farm, and uh, the the uh, item is from Clean Technic, and you probably don't have the item, and so I'll just go ahead and read the title. I think you better because I don't. Okay, Idaho National Laboratory is developing software to help farmers manage um, water shortage. That's the title. Idaho National Laboratory scientists explore water supply and extreme weather events through the INL uh, research efforts. Now a team from the lab is working with Nicholson Farms to develop software that can supply the farms in droughts. Now, the deal here, I'm gonna put this picture up because I hadn't before. The deal here is that um, what they're looking at is a way, and I'm pretty sure it's not what you're seeing, but it's a way to supply water to plants on the farm that reduces the need for the amount of water. And then the way to do that would be to supply the water exactly where the plant most needs it and not just throw it around. Okay. Yeah. We are up to Wednesday, February 22nd. Well, I think now I got a picture again. This is a picture of a house with solar panels in front of it. It sure is. It's a weird house with uh, tracking panels. And of course, because they're trackers, they look a little strange. This is from Yahoo News. It certainly is. And it says, and I quote, Republican operatives are astroturfing opposition to solar power. Yeah. Some grassroots groups opposed to local solar projects have been have something in common. And that thing is a group in Virginia with powerful uh, Republican connections. Citizens for Responsible Solar, that's the name of the group, gives advice on strategy according to an expose by National Public Radio and a news collective uh, called Floodlight. And what they're trying to do is to prevent solar uh, power from being, from being installed. I didn't, I'll have to advance that picture. They're preventing solar power from being installed in uh, uh, various places around the United States. They go into an area and organize what is called a grassroots movement because I don't think that it's really right to call a movement grassroots if it's organized by organizers from outside the area. No, there's, there's some falsehoods there. I think so. Yeah, I think, I think that that is kind of false. Um, anyway, there it is. Now, do you have more on that one, or should we go on again? Basically, they're just trying to convince people that they, they shouldn't do the right thing. Well, you, you know, I, I think about that thing that happened a couple of years ago in Pownell, Vermont, where the local fire company, I think it was the fire company, wanted to have a solar uh, array so that they could power the, the water facility at the um, at, at power a water facility, power pumps at a, at a place that would get well water into their trucks to fight fires. And that way they could use solar power to, to, to get water instead of paying for grid power. And all of a sudden there was a huge um, uh, organization go in opposition to this. And one of the things that they were saying was they didn't want solar panels in that location because they had toxic things in them like cadmium and arsenic that would leach into the groundwater. And the people who were putting the panels, who were, had been hired to put the panels up said, wait a minute, there's no arsenic or cadmium in the panels that we're going to be putting up. That's, those things are used in places where it's super hot, and Vermont is not super hot, and it just didn't have, it didn't, it didn't work. Uh, Plus the panels are sealed anyhow. Yes, the panels are sealed anyhow. They so what are you going to do? You're going to leach this stuff out of uh, something that's been vitrified. Anyway, 
it didn't work. The explanation didn't work. And the people in the audience got so abusive that all but one member of the board that was that was considering this resigned within three days. No kidding. And then what happened? Should have. You know, these guys are being dishonest. I know. The, any anyway, what happened after that was, it turned out that the that the groundwater these people were trying to protect from solar panels was so badly contaminated that they couldn't use it. <laughs> and that was something that they found out months it. later. It had been contaminated by chemicals that were used to uh, produce Teflon in a local plant that had long since closed. Uh, that was Bennington, wasn't it? Uh, it was near Bennington. It was Poundland. Yeah, Hoosier Falls. Yeah, and the, and the, 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 um, the uh, Hoosick River going through Poundland is a river that is 100% of the river as it goes through Vermont is, is uh, a waterway that people should not fish in because the fish are contaminated. So, you know, we've, we've got to get real about this stuff. And, and fighting solar panels, they should, they should try to understand what the truth is before they start. And, and when you have people doing organizing like that, the only way to find the truth is to find out from somebody else well, some of it's ideology. They don't even want to know the truth. They want very much not to know the truth in some cases. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, there, there, I, one of the things that I, that I keep getting back to is the fact that there was a man who was employed at Harvard um, who, who over a period of almost 10 years earned almost a million dollars over and above what he was paid by Harvard to write peer-reviewed articles that said that they questioned whether human-caused climate change was happening, and and, and I recall uh, reading about that. Yeah, and it, these things were p published in peer-reviewed uh, papers uh, in journals relating to uh, uh, astrophysics, and th the reason was because they couldn't publish them in peer-reviewed papers. The, the, in peer-reviewed journals relating to, chemi to climate change, climate or, or weather, because they would have been trounced by the people doing the reviews. But in doing it in physics, they were just, the physics um, scientists were just looking at it to check the equations that they knew of from physics. And that, the, the whole thing was, was laid bare by when the when the, uh, um, I think it was the Sierra Club, showed that this, this person had um, failed to, to tell the papers that these were published in that he had a, um, that he should be disclosing an outside source of income, and he failed to show that. So, yeah. Okay, we are up to a, a picture of penguins. That's what it looks like to me. With no snow, and an but article from not CNN. Happy about that. I don't think so. I think penguins prefer snow. Yeah, and those little wings that they have—they use to fly underwater. They actually yeah, yeah, underwater. That's exactly what they do. Unbelievably they fast underwater. That's amazing. Yeah, isn't it? Okay, what do you have for title? Antarctic sea ice hits record lows again. Scientists wonder if it's the beginning of the end. Yeah, we're back to things like Thwaites Glacier. You know, this is not good. Antarctic sea ice has reached record low levels for the second time in two years, with some scientists alarmed that dramatic drops are a signal of climate crisis, maybe more clearly influencing this vast, complex, isolated region. Uh, let me translate that. That means that sea level rise is probably going to happen faster than we had realized. Not good news. It is, it is not good news. No, you're absolutely right about that, Tom. Okay, we are up to our last article. And we have we a, got a picture here of, are you ready for this? Wind uh, turbines. What an amazing thing. Are you sure that's what they are? Well, they don't look like golf carts to me. They they don't, and they also don't look like a lot of other things. <laughs> um, 
you know, they don't look like the books on the shelves in, in my, at my home. This is from Vox. What Europe showed the world about renewable energy. Yeah, and this is an interesting article. One year ago, on the cusp of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, it seemed unimaginable that renewable energy in Europe could overtake electricity from oil and gas. But not even a year later, it did. By the end of 2022, wind and solar combined overtook natural gas in electricity generation. So now, Europe has been really moved ahead in um, renewable energy, and the, the thing that really moved them was the fact that Russia invaded Ukraine, which it did, I think, because Vladimir Putin was worried that the Europeans were going to um, move to renewable energy and shut down his markets. Yeah. So, you know, this, this thing in, in Ukraine, so far, the Russians under, under his um, leadership have just made one mistake after another. And I don't know whether this is, this is, it's a scary war because I'm worried that he could actually start using nuclear weapons. He could, but I don't think he will. Well, I would That's hope... That's opening up a can of worms. I don't think even he wants to open. I, you may be right, but I don't think he's sane. No, that's, that's not very debatable, I think. Yeah, and what is he going to do? Um, and and the... the um, I, I just don't know where he's going to go next. It's, I find the, the situation scary. On the other hand, I've been reading about his health, and it sound, he never goes anywhere without at least two doctors. Oh, apparently. yeah? That's what I've read. And he, he's switched from a, from a normal car to, to be chauffeured around in to a stretch limousine with a bed in it. Oh, no kidding. I don't think this oh, guy is... I don't think this guy is well. Okay, that was our last story. And uh, what I'm going to do is put up the slide that has our... Our, our wish for the, for the week to our viewers, which is to have a fundamentally fantastic week. And there you have it. So, yeah, I'm waving goodbye. Are you? I am. Are you? Yeah. Well, whoops, what happened? Uh, huh? I'm waving goodbye too. Somehow or another, I, I managed, ah, there we go. I managed to go to a blank screen in the, in the, in the screen behind me, but Yes, I'm waving behind, goodbye, and Tom has waved goodbye, and so we wish you all um, a, a fantastic week. There it is. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Oh, you forgot. we forgot. You're supposed to say something about their coming back. Huh? You're supposed to say something about the viewers coming back. Well, you all come back and see us now, you hear? <laughs>